Uh, last class, we looked at assignment four. The videos will be, the video for this lecture and assignment four will be posted tonight. There was just an issue downloading the, um, the video. So that will be posted tonight. And then we have this block of about two weeks um, on reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is, is pretty cool. Uh, we're going to go over the more basic form of reinforcement learning called tabular reinforcement learning. And then later on, toward the end of the course, I will mention to you what deep reinforcement learning is. And then you can go on and take that knowledge to do some deep reinforcement learning if you want on your own. Uh, but assignment five will be uh, the reinforcement learning assignment, and we've got some stuff that we want to cover before then. So hopefully it's, uh, it's pretty fun. I think it's one of the more interesting parts of the course. But the reason that it's toward the end of the course instead of the beginning of the course is because I really wanted you to know all of that search stuff because reinforcement learning um, does have something to do with search. And I also want you to be able to see, for example, um, how you would solve a problem using search. How might you solve a similar problem using genetic algorithm? How might you solve a similar problem using reinforcement learning, right? So showing you reinforcement learning at the end, once you have all of that context, I think is, is the reason why uh, I like putting it toward the second half of the course. So let's get started. Um, lecture number 13, this is a very high level introduction to reinforcement learning. And this is a very good lecture for questions for the exam because it is basically just a bunch of definitions. And of course, we need to know definitions of things on the exam. Um, the textbook that I have listed for the reinforcement learning section of the course, it is completely optional. However, it's free online. And it is by far um, way ahead of the second best textbook I've ever read. So this textbook is excellent. And if you ever have any um, want to know more about the topic of reinforcement learning, or if it comes time for the exam and you're like, I don't quite get that, I would recommend reading the appropriate chapter of the textbook. Now, that being said, um, any question on the exam will be from the slides, okay? I'm not gonna go into all the extra stuff in the textbook, but you will certainly um, have a, a more deeper understanding for the exam if you do read the appropriate sections in the textbook. So please, by all means, have a look at that textbook and follow along. It's really excellent. It is like plain old English. You can read it without having to do any math, and it gives very good explanations of a bunch of topics and way more in depth than I'm gonna go into in the lectures. So what is reinforcement learning? Um, reinforcement learning uh, is a sub area of the topic of machine learning. And it is inspired by natural systems and psychology. And it learns via interaction with the environment. And so it is very biological and psychologically inspired um, in terms of how it actually goes about learning. Um, and in reinforcement learning, what happens is very, very similar to how we learn in real life. Now, I'm not going to say that our brains actually implement this reinforcement learning. I don't want to be as bold as to say that. But it is quite intuitively similar to that. So the way that reinforcement learning works is that you have an agent in an environment, and the agent is going to take some actions, and then based on the actions they perform, they receive rewards. And so if you have a good action, whatever that means, you receive a positive reward, and if you have a bad action, you receive a negative reward. So I'm sure everyone in here has been burned physically at some point in your life. You know, you're not supposed to play with matches. You're not supposed to go near the stove. I've burned myself a number of times. What do you learn when you burn yourself? That didn't feel good. I probably shouldn't do that again. And so what happens, with, at least with humans, we have some belief system, right? And at some point, we don't know that fire bad, right? And then you touch fire, and then you know fire bad and so you don't touch fire again. And so that's the same type of learning that's going on here. So you may have a belief of zero about something, it's neutral, then you eat a piece of candy, and it's like, oh my God, that's the best thing I've ever eaten. So candy is like now a thousand instead of zero. But then you get to my age, and you're like, I shouldn't have eaten all that candy, right? And so not only immediate rewards that you're looking at, but 
we'll talk about this near the end, but the long-term effects of rewards in an environment. And so the goal of a reinforcement learning agent is to maximize rewards. So I want to make sure that I'm doing the things in the environment that get me my rewards. And what we will do in order to solve a particular problem with reinforcement learning is we will structure the rewards that we get to meet the goal of that problem, right? So for example, um, if I want to solve a maze in the least amount of time as possible or do some pathfinding, then I'm going to have a negative reward because by maximizing a negative reward, I'm going to end up getting the shortest path, okay? So everything in reinforcement learning is in terms of these goals. So when I say machine learning, uh, machine learning is a very, very large topic. And if you speak to a lot of people these days, they pretty much think that AI is machine learning or machine learning is AI. Machine learning is a very large subset of the field of AI. But as we've seen in this course so far, there are things that are not what we would consider learning or machine learning, right? So if you're doing an exhaustive search, like a breadth first search or depth first search or A star, we do not consider that to be learning because we don't have a belief that we think of this thing at one point and then after some training we think another thing. It's just, hey, try everything and pick the best thing. But machine learning essentially has some belief about the world and then you encounter the world somehow or you get some samples and then you update your belief about that thing. So it's not evolution, right, in terms of what we talked about um, in two lectures ago with genetic algorithms. That's evolution, right, where we create offspring and then those offspring get mutated and maybe they're better, maybe they're not. This is a single agent learning over time. So within machine learning, there are a few popular categories. Um, one is unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is typically things like clustering. So if I give you a bunch of data, if you go out to be data scientists, for example, the business people at your company may say, we have a ton of data. How can we use that data to maybe increase our revenue, right? So what you could do is if this is like a video game, let's say it's a World of Warcraft, for example, and they give you all the data about all the movements and quests that are done in the game, and you may cluster it and you see, oh wow, there's like, uh, no pun intended, um, oh look, there's like a bunch of quests that we spent a million dollars in, in salaries creating, but nobody ends up doing those quests, right? So maybe we shouldn't make quests like that anymore. So this is this sort of um, clustering and visualization and finding patterns in data um, with some sort of algorithm. Then there's the field of supervised learning and in supervised learning, what you have is something that gives you the right answer, and then you will learn how to get the right answer from data later. I have an example of that in a bit. And then we have reinforcement learning, which is take an agent, put them into an environment, give them a reward signal, meaning that when they do actions in an environment, they'll get rewards, and then over time, that agent is going to learn to associate particular states and actions with rewards or more accurately with returns, which is the sum of future rewards, and then they'll know what good actions to take in the future. So machine learning, um, as I said, we have this thing called supervised learning. And in supervised learning, we're essentially learning from training data. And so what we do, for example, up here, um, we may be given some, this is a, a problem called classification where here we're given some data points, um, some x's and y's, and these are part of a particular group, and these are part of a particular group up here. So for example, if you're working in the healthcare field, um, you may, I don't know, let's take a completely contrived example that's not true, but x1 may be age, and x2 may be eye color, and the categories here are whether or not you are going to have a heart attack or something, right? So based on your age and your eye color, oh look, there's actually this big correlation between whether or not you're gonna have a heart attack. So they give you a bunch of data. Um, so this is the eye color, this is the age. That person didn't have a heart attack. Here's another sample. Um, here's the eye color, here's the age. That person did have a heart attack. And what you will learn over time is that if you're given a new sample that wasn't in the training data, will they have a heart attack or not, right? Now that's obviously a dumb example, but I like to come up with a, a new one every year. 
So you're going to learn to predict the outputs for new unseen samples. In unsupervised learning, you're just given a bunch of data, and then based on that data, you're going to let the computer, or the algorithm is going to learn something without being explicitly told, right? So for example, um, there are algorithms which are called clustering algorithms. These are just like the easiest example to explain. And I give you these data points, and hopefully this clustering algorithm will figure out, hey, look, there's one set of points over here that's kind of isolated, and there's another set of points over here that's kind of isolated. And so there's two clusters of points here. What do they mean? I don't know. I wasn't told what they mean, but I've found this pattern in the data. So that's unsupervised learning. So when it comes to supervised learning in uh, machine learning, this is essentially the workflow for machine learning, where I'm going to have some input data. So for example, um, this is a much better example than the heart attack one I gave, where it's given an image of a piece of fruit, your algorithm is going to learn to say what type of fruit it is, right? So what happens here? Um, this is a little bit small, apologies for the small font. But at some point, we have a supervisor. So the supervisor could be someone that you're asking, what this is in order to get the real answer, or it could be just a data set where everything is already labeled. So what happens is um, you have all this input data, and that input data would be the image of this tomato and then the word tomato, uh, the image of this pear and then the word pear, the image of this orange and then the word orange. So what happens is you feed it through this magical algorithm that somehow learns, and uh, we're We'll learn about neural networks a little bit later in the course and how they may do something like that. Um, so you feed it through this algorithm. It does some processing. This is called the training phase. And so at the beginning, your algorithm may just be returning random fruit, right? I don't know what that is. Maybe it's an apple. I don't know what that is. Maybe it's an orange. Hopefully, through the course of this training, your algorithm gets better and better. Typically, what happens is that your algorithm will make a guess somehow. And then because you know what the real answer is, something in that algorithm is able to say, no, this was actually an orange, not a tomato. So adjust my weights or do something to make my next guess at something that looks similar more orangey. Okay? So I know there's a lot of hand waving there, but we will get to that a bit later in the course. After some amount of training, so maybe you only have a day to train it. Maybe you only have $25 in Amazon credits, whatever that is. Maybe you've ran out of input data. You have a model. This model is essentially um, the output, or sorry, the result of your training process. And then you are going to take that model and deploy it somewhere. So it'll say, here's the input. Um, I think this is a tomato, right? So that model will have some accuracy. Maybe it's 80% accurate. Maybe it's 90% accurate. But this is basically... The, the workflow of supervised learning. Um, there are a couple of different problems that supervised learning can solve. They mainly fall into one of these two categories. One is called classification. In classification, you have a number of different classes of things, right? So here we have um, a bunch of different data points, and they belong to two different classes, so these pluses and these circles. In the previous example, we may have had a dozen different types of fruit, those are classes, okay? So you're going to say, here's n different classes, 0 through n minus 1. Which class does this data sample belong to? So you're picking one of those things. Uh, another type of supervised machine learning is called regression. Uh, you may know this as like a line of best fit, if you've ever done this in Excel or something like that, where you take in, um, let's say, for example, uh, the samples that I've given you, instead of being a picture and the word tomato, it's the value of x, let's say 5, and then, so if the value of x is 5 and my value of y is 25, that's one training point. If my value of x is 3 and the value of y is 9, that's another training point. The value of x is 10 and the value of y is 100. So you're all doing some machine learning in your head now. What's the function that I'm trying to get you to learn? Squaring x, right? Same thing happens in regression. So this here, if you have just a line of best fit through all those points, that would be linear regression. You can also have nonlinear regression, meaning that the function that you're trying to learn is nonlinear. 
And what happens over time is your initial guess, the line of that, the function that you're learning over time matches more and more with the data set. And the point of this is that if I give you a new x value, like 6, what would you say? 36. OK, so you can square numbers. That's good. Here, you have a much more complicated relationship than just x squared, but this may be some very important thing, right? Some medical thing, detecting cancer in somebody. And so if you get a new value in, you can approximate the value of the function, but you don't know what the function exactly is, right? So you've learned that through this process of regression. In unsupervised learning, uh, this is a cool example. So this is a bit small, and I'll make it bigger in a second. But this example comes from character recognition. Okay, so let's say I give you the written, handwritten characters from 0 to 9, so all 10 of our numbers. And you are going to use some form of unsupervised learning to say, OK, um, there's 10 different numbers. I know that. So let's try and form 10 different clusters based on the properties of those. And different unsupervised learning algorithms will, um, will cluster things differently. But what we get in the end is some sort of visualization of the clusters of these points in our data set, right? So you can see over here, all these fours are together. But then there's like a seven that someone wrote that kind of looks like a four, right? So if you can see how this would be very useful for determining, oh, look, the twos that are misclassified are because it, they have these properties that are very much like a three. Or you can see a bunch of fours in with the nines because they're kind of similarly written. Right? So unsupervised learning is this sort of magical algorithm that is able to take data and classify it somehow. If you want to know more about that, take the machine learning course. We're not going to go into any particular unsupervised learning algorithms um, in this class. So that's supervised learning and unsupervised learning and the type of problems that they work on. Now, what about reinforcement learning? So reinforcement learning is not a single algorithm, right? So reinforcement learning is not like A star or BFS. Um, it's more like search in general, where there's like a process going on in order to solve a problem, OK? So reinforcement learning is more of a problem specification. In order to be able to apply the principles of reinforcement learning to a problem, your problem has to be specified in a very specific way. Just like if you wanted to apply search to something, you've got to have like a performance measure. You've got to determine the actions that are possible. You need to know all the legal actions, et cetera, et cetera. So in order to do that type of solution, you have to be able to phrase a problem in a specific way. And in order to do reinforcement learning, you have to phrase the problem in another very specific way. It could be the same problem that you solve with two different methods. But to apply these methods, a bunch of things have to happen first. Many different algorithmic techniques can be used to solve reinforcement learning problems. Okay? And if you hear someone say, uh, I used a reinforcement learning method, then what they meant was that this method solves this reinforcement learning problem that you've specified in a very specific way. So reinforcement learning in general, it learns via interaction with the environment. There is no explicit teacher or supervisor for learning. So there's nothing out there saying exactly what you should do in any given situation. But the agent is going to take an action and then receive a reward signal from the environment. Now, um, what this does, hopefully, is that learning via this interaction and getting rewards teaches us about cause and effect and the consequences of actions and what to do to achieve your goals. So in the real world, we have some senses, right? So I can touch things. I can smell things. There's like things that have been. Uh, genetically programmed into you as this sort of reward signal. And so, you know, as we evolve, people, and, and you may say, for example, how does my body know that fire is bad? How does it know to hurt me, to move me away from fire, or things that are really hot or really cold? The thing is, it doesn't know. So if we go back to our lecture on evolution, it just so happens that some people, through the course of evolution, some organisms, um, have 
nerves in them, whether they were evolved or mutated or whatever, to feel fire and go, ouch, I shouldn't be next to that. There were other people, believe it or not, who feel fire and don't go, ouch, and don't walk away from it. And what happens to those people? They die, because <laughs> they don't know that fire is bad. So if they're dying because they're walking into fire or cold or these other things that their senses don't tell them are bad, then they're not going to reproduce and they're not going to pass on those genes that don't know that fire is bad. So your body comes with it through evolution, the reward signal, right? The reward signal um, through the environment, that's something that is just inherent to you, like touching something, maybe, you know, like, Falling in love has some reward signal associated with it. All this brain and body chemistry that you were born with is basically your reward signal. In the real world, there are also like social reward signals, like, you know, maybe you dressed well that day, someone gave you a compliment, that's good. It's not like vital to survival, but there's all sorts of different reward signals going on in the real world. But when we phrase this as a reinforcement learning problem that we're going to have to program, we are going to have to give it a very specific reward signal that it wants to maximize. Okay, so that's kind of the difference between the real world, where there are reward signals going on that we had no saying in, and the artificial world, where we have to very specifically define our reward signal. So what happens is, both in reinforcement learning and in the real world, we have an environment and we have an agent. This environment is going to contain the states of the environment, like I'm here, I'm over there. It's going to contain the legal actions that we're allowed to perform. And the environment is going to, quote unquote, contain the reward signal. And then we have an agent. That agent is going to perform an action, like touching the stove, right, or eating a candy. And then from the environment, it is going to get the reward that it got from doing that and also the next state of the environment, right? So if I touch something, the next state might involve my hand also being burned, right? Yep. This looks pretty similar to what we covered before, but like instead of having like a goal state, like a definitive, this is the correct solution, we have like a sort of more variable phrase in there, I guess. So all of the terminology here is the same as before. But what we're working towards is the definition of how to specify a problem such that reinforcement learning can solve it. So these states and actions, they're the same. The only really new thing here is the reward. And so rather than specifying, like, this is the goal state, stop the search, you may just get a big reward for reaching what we've defined as the goal state. It's just a different way of thinking about the problem. Yeah. No, because it's not. It's, it's not. Um, that's a form of machine learning. Depending on who you talk to, genetic algorithms are machine learning or not. I, I think they are learning through the process of evolution. Um, but there's not that same, like, in, in, genet in a genetic algorithm, we have a whole population. They're selected and then reproduce and then they get mutated. That is not, and, and then there's a new individual, right? That's not an agent learning to update its belief over time through interaction with the environment. It's just a different process. So no, genetic algorithms are not con considered reinforcement learning. But you're, you are correct in saying that fitness is sort of like a reward. But the fitness evaluates an individual. It doesn't just give you a reward for a specific action. Right? OK. So. In, you know, in the real world, uh, a better example of this is that like, the dog over here is going to take some action. Like, oh, look, I'm playing with um, my human. And then I'm going to get the stick. If I get the stick, I get a treat. Um, and then the next state or the next observation is going to be me eating that treat from which I'm going to get a big reward. So maybe when the stick is thrown again, I should bring it back and get another treat. And this is like very close to how you actually train animals in the real world, right? <clears throat> some people, um, like the animal is trying to maximize its reward. So what some people do 
is when the animal does something that it doesn't want to happen. It's going to give a big negative reward, like a shock collar or like kick it or whip it or something terrible. So that's one way of doing it, because then the animal will be like, well, I want to maximize my reward. That was a negative reward, so I shouldn't do the things that made me get hit. But another way of thinking about it is when it does the right thing, you give it a positive reward, right? And then it knows what was right. So what would you rather do when you're training an animal? Go through a, a million things that weren't right and give it negative rewards, or when it does the right thing, give it the positive reward, right? One of them, like, mathematically learns faster. So, like, don't hit your dog, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, an individual does not change in a genetic algorithm. You well, get... Children will... Sure. Yep. So this one changes the individual, it, it seems. Like, what, what, is, what is changing inside of the agent now? If it's not making children, then it's not having children that are different. So, so this is a very high-level overview of the process that's going on. The details will become apparent over the next couple of lectures. But we're going to essentially have a value associated with, if I'm in front of the stove, I have two actions. One is touching the hot stove. The other is not touching the hot stove. I'm going to have some numerical value associated with my belief of what the reward will be if I do both of those things. And as I do those things more and more, my values are going to become more and more true to the real value over time. And so I will have a value that says not touching the stove is pretty, that's like a zero value. So I could take or leave not touching the stove. But touching the stove is like a negative one million value, so don't touch that. So we will actually have numerical beliefs about the value of actions that we update over time. Yeah. No, it, it, the algorithms are completely separate. Let's not try and view them as that. Okay. Over time, at the end of the reinforcement learning stuff, we'll see how it is very similar to search. But let's just let it, yeah, if you're, if you're thinking about this in terms of other algorithms, just let all this sink in before we start making those comparisons. So if we get a little bit more technical with our definition, what happens is we have an agent at a particular time step. So at some point, We've made some actions, we've gotten some rewards, and we're at, currently we're at time step t, right? So when you just start off, you're going to be at time step 0, you're going to take an action, you're going to go to time step 1, right? So you've got an agent, you take an action at time step t, that action is a sub t. So that, that is the action you took at time step t. Then what's going to happen is that action is going to go into the environment, and you are going to get a new reward, and then you're going to get a new state. So the environment physically changes somehow. Maybe it doesn't, maybe it does. You get a new state, and you get a reward from doing that. The reward goes into the agent, and the state goes into the agent. And so what you do is now you have a new sample for what happens when I do action A at state S. I got this reward, so update my internal belief about how good that action is at that state. And again, as we get more into it and give examples, this will become more apparent or more, um, more easy to understand. So the agent and environment are going to act in discrete time steps. So as we are learning, we have to define some sort of time steps. t equals 0, 1, 2, 3. So if we do have a robot, for example, in the real world, well, that's kind of a continuous time environment, right? Whether or not the universe acts in discrete time steps, we don't know yet. But what we're going to have to do is do something like, OK, if we have a real robot in a real environment, let's say that my time steps are every half a second, or every two seconds, or something like that. We have to break it down into these discrete time steps. And so the agent observes a state at time step t. And that state, s sub t, is going to be within the set of all possible states that exist in the environment. The agent produces an action at step t, that is a sub t, 
And that exists in the capital, capital A set of all actions that are legal at S sub t. That's what this means. The environment gets a resulting reward. So that is RT plus 1, which exists in the set of all possible rewards. Typically, that's the real numbers. We transition to the next state, which is SC to ST, blah, ST plus 1, which also exists in the set of all states. And what we get in the book is this cool little diagram down here, where we are at a state, we take an action, we get a reward, then we're at the next state, we take the next action, we get a new reward, then we're at another state, an action, reward, state, action, reward, state, action, reward, state, action, reward. That's what happens in reinforcement learning. So an example of this, in a video game, you have some agent that you want to play a game, it's going to take an action, that action is going to update the, the environment, we're going to get a, geez, this is a pretty quick animation, we're going to get a new state and a new reward, and we'll be like, oh, jumping on that Goomba gave me points, maybe I want points, that's good or bad. So the reinforcement learning workflow, in a nutshell, if you want to use reinforcement learning at work or for your research or whatever, is you will have an environment that you're going to act in, you will have a reward that you're going to assign to actions at particular states, you are going to have some sort of agent which is going to record values and then update its belief of values. What this little thing here shows is a neural network. So you could use a neural network to store those um, those values. We are going to not be using neural networks. We're just going to be using numbers that we update over time. Uh, I'll show you how that works. Then you do some training. So the training phase in reinforcement learning is just, OK, let my mouse run around the maze, or let my baby run around and touch hot things, or whatever the training phase is. And we're going to update our beliefs here until we get our policy or our model. And then we will deploy that model once it has learned to our um, to our satisfaction. So let's look at an example of a reinforcement learning problem. That's a very um, standard example in reinforcement learning, and the book goes into this example in more detail. So this is called the cart pole problem. And the problem here is to balance the pole on the moving base as long as possible. So it's just like you have you know, something that you're trying to balance like this. You're trying to keep it balanced for as long as possible. Your actions. This game is played in like one dimension, kind of. So my actions are move to the left and move to the right. So if the thing starts falling to the left, I've got to move it quickly to the left to balance it. If it starts moving to the right, I've got to move it to the right. Um, so the rewards are going to be plus one for each time step that the thing stays balanced. And if you maximize the reward here, then you maximize the balance time, right? And so this is an episodic task where we have terminal states when the pole falls. So if we were doing training for this, we would set up our simulation so that every time the pole falls, we're just resetting back to the state where the pole is at some angle, right? So here we can see that you know, the thing is trying to, to balance itself, and it's moving back and forth, and this is after the result of some training. So that's one problem here. So what we have done is we've taken the English description of the problem where we have an environment. OK, there's my environment. I have legal actions at particular states. Um, what I want to happen in English description is I want the pole to stay balanced for as long as possible. So typically, if I want something to happen for as long as possible, I will associate a positive reward with that. If I want something to happen as little as possible, I'll associate a negative reward with that. So if I was doing the exact same reinforcement learning algorithm, the exact same RL method here, but I changed the reward to be negative, then it would learn to drop the pole as fast as possible rather than keep it balanced as fast as possible. But just like a genetic algorithm, it's kind of cool because the same algorithm is solving two different problems. We're just changing the evaluation function, which is the reward in this case. This is another example. This is the mountain car problem. And so the mountain car problem, uh, your little car here starts at the bottom of this valley. And the rules and physics of the environment are set up so that I can't just press the gas and escape. So my car's engine is not powerful enough to just escape the valley. So what I have to do is sort of use gravity to my advantage. So I have to move forward a bit, and then I stop, and then I go in reverse, and I go back up the hill, 
and I go forward and I go back up the other side, and each time I do this, I kind of get a bigger push from gravity, and eventually I'm able to escape. And so what your, your reinforcement learning algorithm is, uh, is trying to do is escape as fast as possible. So in this case, if I want to do something as fast as possible, I'm going to give a negative one reward for each time step that I'm not at the goal. Okay? So maximizing reward is minimizing the time to reach the goal. And every time I reach the goal, I reset the cart back to um, its initial position. So these are two examples of how to phrase those, these problems in terms of reinforcement learning. And here we see over time you know, that, uh, that these value, that as we train, so these episodes are you know, from the starting state to uh, the goal state, or sometimes you never reach the goal state because you haven't trained enough yet, and so you may stop the episode after 100 time steps or something like this. So the, the point of these slides, it doesn't really do a great job of illustrating it, but after we've trained for longer, typically our solution is going to be better. Um, so over here, episode 20, you can see we're, we're, we're balancing the pulse so well that it doesn't even look like we're balancing it, right? And down here, we're able to escape with the mountain car problem. So now that we've seen some examples, the elements of reinforcement learning problems that would make a really good exam question would be the agent, the environment, a policy, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, the reward function, which we now know what that is, the value function, which we'll talk about more and more as time goes on through the lectures, and optionally, we have a model of the environment. One of the really cool things about reinforcement learning and machine learning in general is that it does not require a model of the environment. What do I mean by that? Well, when we did search, one of the cool things about search is that you just run the search. It doesn't require any training phase, right? You just run the search. And if the whole problem changes, you don't need to retrain your model. You just run the search. But the problem with search is you need to be able to search down the search tree, creating new states, backing up states, right? So with, with search, you need a model of the environment, right? If you don't know how to transition from one state to another in the environment exactly and put that into your search algorithm, you can't use search. So for example, if I wanted to um, play StarCraft with a search algorithm, I would need to have the source code of the StarCraft engine. Machine learning does not need a model. It can have a model, and you can probably speed up your training if you do have a model. But right here, for example, in the mountain car problem, Reinforcement learning doesn't need to know anything about gravity. It just needs to know when I'm at this state of the environment and I'm about to start going down, I should press the gas because that ends up maximizing my reward. The, the child doesn't need to know about thermodynamics in order to know that touching the stove is bad. It just knows that it got a negative reward, so it won't do it again. Right? So it, you do not need a model of the environment to do um, machine learning, and especially in reinforcement learning. The policy. What is the policy in reinforcement learning? The policy is a mapping from states of the environment to action taken at those states. So basically, if I'm at this state, do this action. That is literally what the policy is. So that might be a simple lookup table. So if we can index our state in a table, uh, like in assignment two, for example, if I'm at state x, y, we could look up in a grid and it'll say move left. So that's a policy. Or it could be a very complex calculation like a neural network, right? The input to the neural network could be the x and y location of where I am, and the output might be the action that I should, I should perform. And the policy is really the core of a reinforcement learning agent because it defines the behavior, okay? And so it may be deterministic, it may also be stochastic. So a policy in re reinforcement learning may say, half the time do this, half the time do this other thing. Here's an example. So a policy in reinforcement learning is typically represented by the symbol pi. Okay? So the policy at a time step t is pi sub t. The policy maps from the states of an environment to the probability of taking an action at that state. So the definition here is that pi sub t, our policy at time step t, 
for taking an action at a given state, so pi sub t of s a, that is the probability that an action gets taken, a t equals a, when state s t equals s. So it basically says, if I have a state and I have an action, my policy will store the probability that I should take that action at that state at that time step. So that's what that means. Reinforcement learning methods specify how an agent changes its policy over time as it learns. So different RL algorithms that you apply to RL problems will change, for example, how the policy is stored. Maybe it's in a table. Maybe it's in a function. Maybe it's in a neural net. Maybe it's in a file, right? Um, how those values get updated. How do we actually, if we saw something was hot, how do we change that value? That's what, that's what um, different algorithms have different ways of updating that policy. So the agent's goal is to form a policy that gets as much reward as it can over time. So another example of a policy that I've already showed. So this is assignment five in the class. And this is the agent right here. It's in a grid world. Uh, the white squares it can move around in. The darker squares are walls that it cannot move through. And it's trying to get to any one of these um, green squares. So this is a policy which essentially says, what direction should I go to, go in to get to the nearest green square? Okay, so for example, um, right here, it says go to the right. And you can follow the policy because it's a nice uh, cherry-picked example of a visual policy, um, a policy that we can visualize. So it says to get from here to the nearest green square, go down and then to the left. Uh, here it says go literally in any direction. Why? Because if we go in any direction, we're actually going the same distance towards one of the green ones. So if we go here, for example, now, well, this is down and to the left, so I could either go left or down. And so we would choose one with 50-50 probability. So this is another example of a policy. And I believe I've already showed this in the class. But this is the example of the policy table for blackjack, right? So in blackjack, the game, if, uh, if I have these cards over here and the um, dealer has these cards over here, then I should take this action. And so for this example here and for this example here, sorry, for this example and this example, you see how these are stored in a table? So the states are indices into that table. So because the problem is small enough, like for example, I couldn't represent all the possible states of chess or go in a table. We don't have enough memory to do that, right? So if we can store in a few megabytes or I guess a few gigabytes the table of all the possible game states, then since we can look it up in a table, this is called a tabular policy. And that is tabular reinforcement learning. So in this course and our assignment, we're going to be doing tabular reinforcement learning because the problems will be small enough to fit in memory like this. But there are other forms of reinforcement learning that use different representations, but the problems are so big that you can no longer store a table. OK. So, yep. Let's not worry about that, um, because there's different ways that you could formulate it. But here, it's just w the least amount of movements, we'll say. The least amount of movements? Yes, the least amount of actions. So this will be assignment five. We'll, you'll get sick of that. So we'll come back to this, this particular problem. But it just shows you what a policy is. So the important part there is that if I'm in a particular state, here's what I should do. The, the, the context of that, we'll, we'll get to that once we get to assignment five. Next is a reward function. The reward function is defined by the goal in the reinforcement learning problem. And so it maps each perceived state, or more specifically, each state action pair. So if I'm in this state and I take this action, it maps that to a single number. And that number is the reward. Rewards come from the environment, not the agent. So this is very, very important. The agent cannot decide what its reward is. Because if it could, it would just say, I get all the reward all the time. So the important part here is that the environment sort of decides on the reward, right? If I touch the hot stove, that's because I didn't decide that that was a good thing to do. It's just that like the environment or my nerves told me that that was a good or bad thing to do. 
There's another definition here, which is the return. The return is the sum of future rewards in this episode. So yes, it is often good to take the immediately good thing, but let's say that I'm in a particular location and step one is eating a piece of candy and step two is walking off a cliff. That's probably not my desired action is to take that piece of candy, right? Because we're talking about the long-term return which is the sum of the future rewards. So if getting a positive reward is immediately followed by a ton of negative reward, maybe we don't want that particular positive reward. And we'll talk about how we um, deal with that a bit later. And so the RL agent's goal, we said before it was to maximize reward, but it's really to maximize return. So for, my, for the duration of this problem, what is the sum of all my rewards? That's what I really want to maximize. And so in biology, you know, just one very simple example is that reward is pleasure or pain. Maybe we want to maximize the reward or the pleasure that we get over time. Here's some uh, example, more examples of reward functions. In pathfinding, we could say that the goal state is terminal. Uh, Non-goal states have a minus one reward. And then, uh, so if we give, let's say even if the goal state has a zero reward, if all the non-goal states have a minus one reward, we basically don't want to be anywhere except for um, the goal state. And so we will learn to maximize our reward by getting to the goal state. So, you know, if you've ever seen Rick and Morty, like the blue Meeseeks character, like it just wants, it doesn't want to exist, right? So existence is pain. And when we're trying to mi minimize the distance, then existence is pain. We want to get to the rewards or the goal state as fast as possible. In blackjack, for example, or other card games or board games, if you reach a state where you are winning, that's a positive reward. If you reach a state where you're losing, that's a negative reward. And so the reward may be proportional to the money that you win or lose. So if you're playing blackjack and the dealer has a 10 showing and you have uh, a 7 and you hit, well, you're going to lose a bunch of money. And so hopefully over time you'll learn oh, the last few times I did that, I lost a bunch of money. So I should probably stick when I get to 17 rather than hitting when I get to 17. And if we have like more complex problems, like we're playing Mario over here, you know, our reward over time, maybe we, we want to get a mushroom, maybe we want to get coins, maybe we want to get points, we want to finish the level, we want to go to the right. There's all sorts of different reward functions that we can think of. I said before that the returns um, are the sum of rewards. So basically, at each time step of the episode that we're thinking about, we get a, a reward. So RT, RT plus 1, RT plus 2, all the way up to the terminal one. And uh, the, reward, the return is just the sum of those rewards. So what value do we want to maximize? We want to maximize the expected return. Expected return meaning on average. Right? So if we think of a game like blackjack, there's a bit of randomness there. If we're rolling dice, there's a little bit of randomness there. So we, even though we can't guarantee the return, we can look toward the expected return. Right? So for example, um, if you have a 10-sided die and on everything but a 10, you win $100, but on a 10, you lose $100, then what is the expected return of rolling the dice? 90 bucks, right? Because you got nine of them that give you 100 and one of them that give you minus 100. So if you do it a million times, you'll be up $90 per roll on average. So that's the expected return. And this is another cool thing, is that reinforcement learning deals with randomness too. Imagine you were doing assignment two, but let's say that um, whenever you moved left, you had a 10% chance to be teleported to the right. Instead, how do we deal with that with A star? We, we can't, right? So, oh, we could, but it's, it's really complicated. But reinforcement learning, you know, even if half the time we touch a stove, it's really hot, we still learn that you should, probably shouldn't touch the stove. So it's, it's cool. It deals with randomness as well. So in an episodic task, meaning that it has a beginning and an end, return is represented by G. Why did they choose G? I don't know, but that's what's in the book. So G of T is RT plus RT plus 1 plus dot, 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 all the way up to the terminal state, where T is the final step at a terminal state. 
So we sum up all the rewards that we got, and that was essentially how good the episode was. And so an optimal policy, pi star, that's the optimal policy, maximizes the expected return. All right, now we have a value function. This is really getting into the mathematics of how RL starts to work. So the rewards are what are immediately good. The value function indicates what may be eventually good or bad on expectation. So the value of a state or a state action pair is the total amount of reward an agent can expect to accumulate in the future given that it is currently in this state. And so values determine long-term desirability. So um, if a reward is immediate pleasure or pain, value is sort of how pleased or displeased I am to be at that state. And we're going to seek actions at states that have the highest value because they will bring the highest eventual return. Value is harder to determine than reward, so we must calculate and estimate them. And our policy should ideally take us toward high-valued actions. So what does this mean? Well, let's say, I don't know, I've got this table here, and like, I've got to keep moving in whatever direction that I choose. Okay? So three steps down that way, there might be a cake. That table is going to hurt me when I walk into it. Or maybe it's lava or something like that. So if I choose, maybe there's a candy at step one. That's a good reward, right? So I take the candy. Now I'm here, but I have to go into the lava, and that sucks. So back here at this state, the reward from taking this action is really high because the next thing is a piece of candy. But the value of being that state has to take into account what will eventually happen at that state. And if I go this direction from this state, well, eventually I'll fall into lava. And all the candy in the world doesn't matter. Okay? So value somehow has calculated on expectation, if I'm at this state and I take this action, what's going to happen down the road for the rest of the, the episode, not just immediately. So there's a big difference between value and reward, and, and that's an important distinction. So here's a value function example. Um, for pathfinding, a non-goal state on the best path to the goal has hired high desirability and a high value. And so actions taking us on this path have a high value. In blackjack, me having 20 with the dealer showing a 6 has a high probability of me winning, so it has a high value. So this is an example, a stochastic example, where we have randomness, right? If I have 20 and the dealer has a 6, the rules of blackjack state that the dealer has to bet, or they, they have to hit, right? And there's a very high chance of the dealer losing outright to going over 21. So when the dealer have a, has a 6 and we have 20, this is one of the best possible situations in blackjack, right? So I'm very happy. This is a good value. I want to get to that state, and I'm happy when I'm in that state. But even though it has a high value, we still could get incredibly unlucky, and the dealer could, okay, it has a 6, it flips over a 10, and then a 5, and it gets 21. Just because in that particular episode, the reward was negative because we got unlucky, doesn't mean that most of the time we're still very happy to be in this state. So that's the difference between reward, we got unlucky this time, and value, which is that if we did this a million times, I'm going to be way up. My expected value is very high. Last thing we talked about uh, was a model of the environment. So let's say, um, for example, we want to guide around a robot in a real-world environment. A model of that environment might be a robotic simulation of that environment. Right, where I've written a program that simulates the physics, etc. So if I wanted to apply search to a robot, I would have to have a model to say, that says, if I move left, where, what's the resulting state from moving left? I need to know that, because I need to be able to plan my path. But reinforcement learning doesn't need to know that. All it needs to know that when I was in that state and I did an action, what was the reward that I got? So a model of the environment is going to mimic the behavior of an environment 
So for example, given a state and an action, the model is going to either give us or attempt to predict the next state. And so models are used for these planning type of algorithms. We need a model to do A star. We need a model to do minimax and alpha beta. That's a downside of a search algorithm. We need a model. It is not, necessarily, uh, it is not necessary uh, for reinforcement learning in general, but it is often used in games. So for example, you don't need a model to learn how to play chess with reinforcement learning. You could just observe a bunch of games, right? But what happens when you run out of games to observe? Well, it would be nice if we could generate and play against ourselves and learn with reinforcement learning, if we had a model of the game of chess, that would be great. It would help us, but it's not necessary. Okay? So even though models are generally not necessary for reinforcement learning, you can still use them to speed up the learning process and the training process. And the last thing that I'll say here um, to end this lecture is that we will see in reinforcement learning, and we basically have a whole lecture on this, this concept of exploration versus exploitation. And this is one of the main challenges in reinforcement learning, and also one of the main challenges in life, in my opinion. And it's the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. So in order to obtain a lot of reward, the agent must prefer actions that it knows already produce good results. Right? So if I know going left has led to better things in the past than going right, then I want to go left. But the problem is, in order to learn which actions produce good results, we have to try them first. Right? And the more we try them, the more sure we get about how good they are. Maybe there's some randomness, and the first time I went left, it was really good, but actually like 90% of the time, it's really bad. So the agent must exploit knowledge that it has, but also explore to gain more knowledge. And this is one of the main challenges of like real life as well. So just a quick example, um, who can give me like a real world example of exploitation versus exploration? Something where you have to make a choice. Yep. Can you speed running video games? Like where you're trying a different path to find something that might be faster versus trying to like get down the move perfectly? Yep. I think there's much simpler examples. I'm going to see if someone can guess the example that I have on the slide. But that's true, right? In order to know what path to take, you have to have tried the path before. Yes. Explain. Uh, like you need to take courses yep. uh, to figure out what you want to study. Um, yeah. So it's kind of like I'm not sure what I want to do. I kind of have an idea, but in order to know what I like, I need to try it first, right? Did you have a? Uh, deciding to move, maybe. Okay. Explain. Yep, that's, that's a great example. How about literally something that every one of us does multiple times per day? Yep. Food. There you go. OK. <laughs> so no one watched the lecture from last year. So basically, um, I could go to the place that I know is all right, or I could try a new place that I've never eaten at before. So for like 20 years, if you asked me, choose a fast food burger, like under 10 bucks. I would have said Wendy's. Like, my whole life. My friends worked at Wendy's. I used to, you know, in high school, always at Wendy's. Nothing wrong with a junior bacon cheeseburger or a baconator. Well, there is a lot of things wrong with them. But, like, they're tasty, <laughs> right? And then someone forced me to go to Dairy Queen. Dairy Queen burgers are amazing. What happened to Dairy Queen in, like, the last 10 years? Because they used to have it in the university center, and I never liked it. But, like... Like combo number one, like the double burger from Dairy Queen, it's just insanely high quality. And the only reason I know, it's just, it's better than the classic single at Wendy's. I'm going to say it. And this is coming from someone who loved Wendy's. But I never would have known that if someone didn't force me to go to Dairy Queen that one day. 
and force me to eat it. So I'm not saying like, I don't work for Dairy Queen. <laughs> I don't, I don't have, like, stock in Dairy Queen. That's just an example, you know? You could just go to that restaurant that you know is great, or you try something new, and you end up liking it. And then, oh, now I have to decide between that place and another place. And so this is an example that we all do every day. And all the other examples you gave were, were also perfectly acceptable. If I ask on an exam, what is an example of exploitation versus exploration? You're not going to choose a restaurant. You're going to choose a different example but you're going to have to explain why, right? Because I think, you know, I have some knowledge about these things, therefore I like to do that. My brother told me computer science is great, but it wasn't until I tried computer science that I hated it, right? Maybe I'll go into do a music degree or something like that. So you really have to try things. That's the balance. It's like you've only got so much time in the world, and you've, you're making decisions based on what you know, but when do you decide to try something new to update what you know? Right? That's a really hard balance. And it's the same thing in reinforcement learning. Also, playing games. Right? I, cho I chose number, door number three last time, and it had 10 gold pieces. Is there a dragon behind door number one? I don't know. Is it worth trying something new? It's, it's a hard decision to make. And so we look at these things all the time in dating, in jobs. Jobs like, you've got to choose a job. You know, if you're working for 80K over here, maybe you could get more if you started applying other, other places, but that's like, that's effort, right? Maybe I'll just stay where I am. So like exploration versus exploitation is not only reinforcement learning, it's also like a problem in the 